Hello everybody and welcome to this week's video. Now, probably a couple of months ago, um, if you can remember that far back, I, I switched over to Sony, a Sony system, rather than at the time I was using Sony cameras as well as Canon. And if you'll also remember that, meant that I could then switch to a dedicated Sony wildlife lens, which was the 200 to 600 zoom. But what that left me with was a need for a backup camera because I do run workshops and one-to-one -one courses and for myself I always feel like I need a spare camera just for that odd occasion when something happens to my camera or something happens to a client's camera and they need a camera to use for the rest of the course I've got a spare that I can throw in that they can use or I can use if mine fouls up. Um, so I was looking for a camera in the Sony range. now. I had many suggestions from the people who watch my videos, all of them pretty good suggestions actually, but there are a number of reasons I've chosen the camera that I've chosen and uh, I, without further ado I suppose I better announce what I've chosen, I've actually chosen another Sony a6400. Um, now there are a number of reasons for that and I'm going to go into them now and hopefully my choice may um, give you food for thought if you're looking at buying your perhaps your first or your second camera or you just want to get into wildlife photography and you know hopefully this will give you a little bit of guidance and some things that you can think about yourself when you make that decision right so the first thing that you need to consider when you're looking at getting a, a camera for wildlife or anything else is your budget and it's quite easy to overstretch yourself. Um, there's a lot of information, especially on YouTube around at the middle, the new Sony cameras have come out, that the Sony A9 Mark II and the Sony A1. Um, I have to be honest, I never even looked at the Sony A1 simply because of the price. Like anybody else, I'm on a budget and I'm running two cameras for a start rather than one. So um, I didn't want to get into a situation where I'm, I'm buying a camera that maybe I've got to pay for over four years or something similar to that and um, the issues you've got then is if you push yourself too far and it's common sense really you know I run a car I've got a daughter at university if we have an emergency I need some money to fall back on if the bottom falls out of the car or whatever or whatever pushing yourself too hard and getting a camera that is costing you six thousand pounds or whatever um, and not leaving yourself any wriggle room for any of those emergencies that happen to us all um, yeah you can end up resenting the camera that you've got and um, you know that's never a good thing you want to have a camera that you're happy with the price you paid for it and that you're getting what you want from it and you know it's not stressing you out in any way whatsoever so for me the A1 was straight out the window I did look at the A9 and the A9 Mark II but then I got to sort of looking at the specifications of cameras and um, yeah it was then that I actually decided well do I need to look at what I need or what I want and there's a subtle difference between those two things and uh, yeah once you've worked out what your budget is then you have to start looking at well actually what does this camera give me and then you can start to make an informed decision so, to decide what we want and what we need, um, I'm going to paint you a little scenario now um, and hopefully you'll see from that that it might help you if you're in this quandary at the minute trying to decide do I go all in for a really expensive camera. So, here's the scenario. I'm walking down a pathway, there's a woodland in front of me and I hear a bird singing, much as you can hear them today and it's, to me it's bird singing. Uh, my bird identification skills from birdsong are pretty much probably just above the if it says its name I know what it is level so you can imagine. So I can't and I can hear a bird singing I don't know what it is so yeah it's just a bird so I continue walking towards the wood uh, 40 meters away yeah, I can still hear this bird no idea what it is it just sounds like any other bird to me get to 15 meters away and I see the bird and it's on the on this branch and it's a bird that I've never photographed before 
Uh, I might be able to identify it from the, what it looks like, but I know it's one I've never photographed. So immediately pick the camera up, go to take a shot. The bird disappears into the trees, never comes back out again. Never got a shot. So if we wind that one to a year later, I'm walking down the same path, woodland in front of me, hear some birds singing, hear a particular bird, I know what that bird is because I've been working all year on my bird identification skills from bird song. So I get to 40 meters away, I can, I can hear the bird, it's still singing away. I get my binoculars out, lift them to my eye and I scan the edge of the woodland. And I hone in on where that sound's coming from and I see the bird. So I'm watching it through my binoculars. The bird's not stressed out by me because I'm too far away. So I'm watching this bird, I watch and I see that it's, it disappears into the bushes and then comes back out again, disappears off this particular branch and then about three minutes later it's back and it's got a beak full of nesting material, disappears into the bushes again, comes back out onto the same branch, disappears, comes back about two or three minutes later onto that branch with a, a beak full of nesting material. So you can see from knowing that bird song and knowing that it's something that I want to take a photograph of, it's enabled me to stay further back which has then enabled me to spend some time looking at the behavior of that bird. So now I know its behavior, so I scan the edge of the wood and I see there's an old tree that's fallen down about 15 meters away on the edge of the wood. So as soon as that bird disappears off that branch away to get more nesting material, I get myself down behind that tree, hidden, bird can't particularly see me, lens over the top of the, of the fallen down tree, trained on that particular branch. The bird turns up my nesting material, I take some images, it comes back out with no nesting material, I take some images, I spend an hour, the light gets better, you know, I get some lovely poses, the bird's not stressed out by me, it's car carrying out its normal behaviour. Now, if you can tell me there, what difference does it make if I've got a Sony A6400, a Sony A9 Mark II, or a Sony A1, or a Sony A6000? It makes no difference whatsoever. I've taken that shot and any of those cameras would be quite capable of taking it but I've taken it and I've done that because I've used stuff that doesn't cost me any money it's just time and experience to learn something a little bit more get more experience more knowledge on the wildlife and the birds that I'm taking images of that enables me to get into a position to take the shot this is just a spade you know the camera is just a spade it digs a hole yeah some dig a little bit deeper some are a bit wider but it digs a hole so it's a tool that does a job i can produce much better images by um developing those skills that cost me nothing only time and effort it doesn't cost me any monetary value to do that so yeah I, what i would say is um that's why my decision was to go for another A6400 rather than an A9, which I looked at, or an A9 Mark II, because it, it doesn't give me sufficient that I require it when I've got other things that I can do that will give me a much bigger percentage improvement. Right, the reason I made that decision is I think you also have to factor in the fact that there is with photography as in a lot of things what I would call the law of diminishing returns and that means that from an entry-level camera to a mid-range camera there's often a big jump in features and things that you get but then as you get further up so as you spend from the like up to a thousand pounds you'll get loads and loads and loads of features coming in along that that road as you get to the top at the top end of that and then you start spending three four five six thousand the little things that you get yeah you are getting improvements don't get me wrong but they're not the big leaps that you get in lower down and you know it's for me as i say those those returns that i'm getting for that outlay of cash are so small that it's far much more worth it to for me to practice these things like you know recognizing my bird calls and things which will give me a much bigger in improvement in my images other, rather than getting a more expensive camera that might have, you know, 60 more focus points or whatever when I've already got 400, you know? 
does it make a big real difference? I'm not sure. So I mean, the, the main features of the A6400 for me are it shoots 11 frames a second. Now you'll say, oh yeah, but the, the A9 or the A9 Mark II shoot at 20 plus frames a second, I think it is. Um, 1000, that's just shot 11 frames. Now if I'm not getting something in 11 frames there, all 20 frames really does for me, I'm going to be honest with you, is that it just means I've got another nine frames to sort through to find the frame that I want. You know, they're all generally good frames, it's just more I've got to sort through, more space on my disk drives. If I can't get it in 11, you know, there's going to be very, very few instances where I need to shoot more than 11 frames a second. So it just makes it not worth it. 11 is plenty for me. Um, it has things like a touch screen, I switch mine off, I'll tell you why um, now, it's just that when I'm focusing, especially for wildlife, I find that my nose on the, will hit the screen and it will act like a finger and it will move my focus point around, which, you know, although it's got it, I don't use it. It has animal eye AF as well as human, so again, this is one of those things that's useful, but I'm not sure I really need it. it. Tends to work well when I've got a deer walking towards me and the focus will switch immediately to the eye. Well, yeah, I can sort of, if it's walking slowly towards me, I can do that mostly myself, you know? Um, I don't know. Is it a gimmick? Not sure. Does it work? Yes. Does it work in the situations where you really need it to work when you've got a fast moving falcon or something shooting across? No, it probably doesn't. Um, if anybody knows whether they've got that to work. And again, that might be something that works on the A9 Mark II or the A1, I don't know. But, you know, its usefulness to me is, well, <sighs> I could live without it. Uh, now, if it's important to the A6400 body doesn't have in body stabilization. But again, that's not something that worries me because the lens has stabilization, so um, I'm getting stabilization in that way rather than in the body. I know you can pair them up and stuff like that. I think most lenses these days have some form of stabilization, so again, it's, it's not a deal breaker for me where I think I've got to upgrade to something else. And again, something really useful for wildlife photography particularly is that uh, the camera has weather seals on it, so you know it will take quite a little bit of harsh and of the harsh environment when you're out and about shooting. Um, I tend to be really cautious with my kit anyway, and you know, this stuff's a lot of money, so I look after it. And you know, if I've got, if I if I knew it was going to rain today or whatever, I'd have a, a cover over it anyway uh, while I was shooting. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I do tend to sort of handle it with kid gloves anyway. So again, although the weather sealing is important and it does help, again, you know. Um, whether that would be a deal breaker or not, I don't know, but the A6400 has it, so it's a good point in its favour. As I say, this is not a full-on review. All I wanted to really try and get across to you today is that there is a lot of information out there, a lot of pressure, um, and a lot of information that try, well, for marketing reasons more than anything else, it'll try and push you towards getting the most expensive camera. Um, and will sometimes you see things that infer that actually you can't do any wildlife photography if you've not got this camera because you know this will change your life I mean that's a load of rubbish um, it helps in various areas but I think I hope I've already proved that you can do stuff yourself that is gonna um, get you much better images than buying a six thousand pound camera would I don't think there's any of us however long we've been doing this that can't learn new stuff and it's that that will get you the big improvements in your photography rather than you know changing your shovel for a shovel that's slightly wider that's basically what you're doing now one of the reasons I did go for the a6400 was um, because I'm doing a lot of filming and I'm filming wildlife as well now this does shoot in 4k although I've never used it in 4k at the minute but it does allow you again to do slow motion so you can shoot at 120 frames a second which allows you to do some nice slow motion footage um, which I love doing actually and the other thing that this has an advantage is it's got a flip screen like a lot of the Sony's have but this one flips up over the top so 
the one I'm recording on now I can actually see I can see myself rather than in the um, so th things like the A6000 or the A6300 the screen doesn't flip all the way over so if you're actually filming yourself sometimes it can be quite annoying to do a whole piece to the camera and then go and have a look at it and find you've cut the top of your head off or whatever or it's not you know it's it's moved slightly from when you set it up um, it's nice to just be able to see so that you can know that you're filming what you want to be filming that's basically the reason that I went for the A6400 over something else that I'm going to mention in a little while that is even cheaper than this. So I hope this, this video has redressed the balance a little bit. As I say, every time a new camera comes out from any manufacturer there's a massive rush for people to get it, to review it, to say it's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, and there's no doubt that these cameras are improvements, you know, they do give you things that say the A6400 won't. But it tends to create an impression that, you know, you can't do wildlife photography unless you splash out and get one of these top-end cameras. And I understand that, you know, there's marketing and stuff involved and sometimes even peer pressure, you know, because people have got the latest kit. So I really just wanted to try and redress the balance. I've, I have got no fear shooting with this camera that I couldn't win Wildlife Photographer of the Year. The things that are holding me back are the skill of the photographer and that's something that I can work on you know as I go throughout life it doesn't really matter on on the the camera now I did say that you know for you for the people out there who are on a tighter budget and I, I, I don't like to class this camera as a budget camera really because you know I've got two of these and both of them cost over 750 quid used um, so they're not cheap you know, especially in the times that we're living in now. So for you people out there who, you know, want to just take those first steps into wildlife photography, a great alternative to this, if you can't spend that 750, 780 quid, and I have to say, these are really, I had four weeks where every camera shop that I looked at, so you know the ones, MPB, Wex, everybody, they were out of stock. As soon as they came in, they were gone. So that must tell you something about these cameras. But yeah, I uh, these are 750, 780 quid at the minute used. An alternative to this, if you don't need a touch screen, and I've already said I don't use it for wildlife photography because my nose operates the um, focus point on the back screen when I'm looking through the viewfinder, so um, I switch it off. Um, and if you don't require a flip screen, I think the A6300 which I think came out in something like 2016, so it's, it's getting on a little bit now, but shoots 11 frames a second, shoots, I think, 4K video, shoots 120 uh, frames for slow motion video. I think the only things that it hasn't got, it hasn't got the screen that flips all the way over, it hasn't got a touch screen. It probably gives you less shots for the battery size and is about five or six grams heavier or something like that. But other than that, it's almost an identical camera and as a wildlife camera to start with that would be a good choice if you're on an even tighter budget you could go to something like the a6000 this is the first camera that started this range it is getting really old now but you know if you want to start in wildlife photography that thing i think still sh i think that shoots 11 frames a second as well um not as many focus points um you know, it will be a step down from the A6300 and the A6400, which are very similar. But if you want to start in wildlife photography, that's a good one to go for. And while we're on the subject, lens-wise, you know, something like a Sigma 100-400. I had the Sigma 100-400 Canon fit that I used with my A6400, and it's brilliant. I used it with the MC11 adapter. I think Sigma do a E-mount version now as well. Um, so yeah, that's a really, really good lens, and um, I think mine was about six, seven hundred quid. I think they may have gone up a little bit in price now, but yeah, if you want to start in wildlife photography, that's definitely a good package to try and aim for. Anyway, that's my new camera, and as I say, I think it's probably one of the best budget wildlife cameras that you can get. It'll do 90% of what the a9 mark ii and the a1 will do and you know that 10 percent extra you're getting probably you can make that up easily in your skills that cost you know developing the skills that cost you nothing 
I've been doing for this for 20 years and I'm probably I'm nowhere near knowing everything about every species that you know that I try and photograph it's always a learning experience that costs you absolutely nothing just your time and your effort your camera the tool that you're going to use an A6400 or an A6300 would be an absolutely fantastic camera to get started with. So, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I mean, I think I'd probably leave you with this. If if I was if I got a paintbrush out of a a set that I got from um, a bargain shop for a pound, and I was trying to paint the next John Constable, um, if you came up to me and said, "Look," I've got this paintbrush here, it's a sable paintbrush, all the hairs have been individually put into that brush and they've all been lined up and you know it'll help you out no end. If you gave me that brush and I then said right well I'm going to paint this constable with that, what you would end up would still look like um, a five year old had gone mad in an art shop. So <laughs> I hope that puts the point across that there is much more than the actual camera that can help you get your wildlife shots. Anyway. On that thought, I'll leave you until next week. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please consider subscribing and give me a thumbs up. It does help the channel grow. And I'll see you next week for another one. Cheers, bye.